I was thinking a lot about the other side of reason, and I guess I'm just going to tell you a story because that's what I do. Um, I wrote about this in my memoir, Ordinary Girls, and um, I didn't really give a lot of the what was happening behind the scenes. So I, I guess I'll tell you what was happening behind the story. Um, I'm going to talk about the baby lollipops murder case. And um, so for those of you who haven't read the book, I'll start from the very beginning. When I was a kid, when I was 11 years old, um, in my community in Miami Beach, where we lived, they found the dead body of a toddler. And um, they found him in, in a neighborhood that was very close to mine, to where we lived. And they didn't know his name. They just knew that he was a toddler, that he was a boy, and that his body was dumped outside of a house in a very, in a rich neighborhood. And they called him Baby John Doe. And at the time, when, when this came out on the news, I was 11 years old and I was shocked because something like this happened in our neighborhood because it seemed like something out of a movie that they found this toddler, that it was so close and that what was happening on the news was also happening in real life in our community. They were um, handing out flyers, asking people do you know the identity of this baby? Do you know this baby's parents? And so we saw this on the news and we also saw this in, in our real life. They were Boy Scouts who were walking around our neighborhoods and handing out flyers and businesses, asking um, people in supermarkets, people around um, my elementary school, do you know this baby? Do you know the, the parents of this baby? Have you seen this baby? Um, and so it seemed like we were living in an episode of some crazy television show and everyone in our community was talking about it from adults to kids we were all talking about this um so when they found the baby he was wearing a t-shirt that had lollipops across the front and because he didn't have a name they called him baby lollipops and um on the news they gave details of his injuries they said he had been abused that he had cigarette burns and that he died and then, so every day this story was on the news and they released more and more details as the weeks pass. Um, one day um, they found out who his mother was and they found out that she um, had, or th what they said is that she and her partner had dumped the baby outside the house and they, they'd taken off. And so they went, um, they left Miami and went to Orlando and she took her other two children with her and they enrolled them in a school. And um, so for weeks, um, they'd just been living their normal life with their other children. And then they found out because they got a phone call from a, a woman who had been a babysitter and said, I know this baby, I took care of him. And then, um, so they went to school at, to, to the other children's school and they asked the teachers what happened. And the teacher said that they had, that the mother had taken the kids out of school and took them to Orlando um, or to Central Florida to a different school. And that's how they located the mother. Um, on the news, once we found out who the mother was and that she had fled with her partner, on the news, um, I remember, that they made it sound so much like that they that both women had done it. Um, and the conversation in our community was very homophobic and it was focused on the fact that the mother was a lesbian because so often on the news and in the newspapers they call, they referred to her as the lesbian mother. Um, and a lot of the conversation, which I was a child and I heard, was about how how could this mother possibly let another woman take care of her child and murder her child? And they made it sound like being a lesbian was part of the crime. So for me as a child, as um, a closeted queer kid who was terrified of coming out, who saw homophobia in our community daily, to me, it, it also made it sound like being gay was the worst possible thing you could be, just like, the same thing as being a murderer, being a child murderer. And it took me so many years to even make sense of 
why I became so obsessed with this story. Um, when when um, Ana Cardona, which was the mother's name, when she when they interviewed her, when the police interviewed her, she told several different stories. She changed her story several times. And then when they interviewed her partner, her partner also told several stories, but then eventually confessed to her part in dumping the body and said that um, Anna had killed the baby. And she pled, she pled guilty. So they were both charged. Um, but her partner pled guilty to second degree murder and she was convicted. Um, she took a plea bargain in exchange for testifying against Anna Cardona. And um, so she got a 40 year sentence and eventually only served 15 years for because of her testimony, because of good behavior. But Anna Cardona, who was the mother, was sentenced to death. And so she spent several, several years on death row. And um, as a kid, as someone who imagined herself a writer, I, I already thought that I would write about this. So I was writing about this since, I mean, since I was an 11 year old kid taking notes and kind of trying to make sense of all of this as a very young closeted queer kid. And um, then 20 years later, when I was in grad school, I decided to finally write an essay about this, um, about my own family and about what was happening in my life, um, about my mother who was suffering from mental illness, but also about the process of discovering this story on the news and watching this unfold as my own life was kind of falling apart. At the time, my mother had kidnapped me and my little sister and took us away from our father who was a custodial parent. And so as I was watching this unfold on the news, my own life was kind of, um, very stressful. I was, my mother was in the middle of an episode, one of her um, episodes while she was not taking her medication and I was terrified of my mother. And at the same time, we find out that the person who killed this baby was his mother. Um, so I was writing about all of this and uh, wrote an essay which was published in the Sun Magazine. And um, after the essay was published, an anti-death penalty activist wrote me, emailed me to say, I read the essay you wrote in the sun and I know the woman you're talking about. I've been visiting her on death row. I've been visiting her in prison and we've been corresponding for over eight years. And I emailed, I responded and I said, if you could put us in touch, I would love to speak with her. Um, it turns out that Anna Cardona was very upset that I had written about her. She read the essay and she was, she was upset. She said, um, how, what gives you the right to write about me? How could you write about me? You didn't, you don't know me and you didn't know my son. How dare you write about me? And I felt like I had crossed the line, like I violated um, some line because she was right. I wrote about her and I didn't know anything about her. Even though what I wrote was not really her story. What I wrote was about the process of discovering, of watching this unfold on TV and about what the media said and about how they portrayed her, which at the time was, she didn't really get to have a say. They, they wrote about her and they talked about her like she was some sort of monster. Um, and they talked about the baby's injuries, and um, they made it seem like she was a monster. She was basically convicted before she even had a trial. And um, as a writer, I wanted to talk about that, to talk about how a mother who is a lesbian is perceived as a monster before she even has a trial, before any of the evidence is even present presented. And so I wrote and I said, I understand why you feel this way, and so I want to tell you my story so that you know who I am. And I wrote these very long, I wrote this, my first letter was a very long letter telling her, this is who I am. And this is why your story resonated with me. And I told her about how I grew up with a mother who suffered from mental illness, who was abusive. I told her about being closeted. I told her everything, um, as much as you can put in a very long letter. And then I said, 
um, I would like to hear your story, not what people said or what the news or what the newspaper said or what was on the news, but the truth, if you'll tell it. And she wrote back a few weeks later and her response kind of floored me. She said, um, she started the letter saying, Dear Ms. Jakira Diaz, this is not a story. This is my life. And um, she put me in my place and I deserved it because I had been thinking of her like she was a story. I had been thinking of her the same way that everyone else had been thinking of. Not like this is a, a human being, but like this is a news story. And um, I apologized. I wrote back. And I said, you're right. And we, we continued to correspond. It was difficult in the beginning, but we continued our correspondence. We wrote letters back and forth. And um, she eventually started opening up. And I told her that I wouldn't write about her unless she, she gave me permission. And then she decided that she actually did want me to write about her that she was fine with me writing about her, except she wanted to control the narrative. She wanted to be able to tell me what I could say and what I couldn't say, which is in a, in a lot of ways what I considered part of my job as a literary journalist was not to exploit the people I write about, but to take to consider what they're allowing me, like the, that their stories are still their stories and not mine. Um, and to, to consider what she wants and how she's never really had any agency and she was never able to control what people said about her. And so I agreed and we wrote back and forth for about five years. And then um, her first, her conviction was overturned and we found out that um, it was overturned because the prosecution withheld evidence and um, she then found out that her partner, Olivia Gonzalez, had confessed to the police that she had, in fact, hit the baby with a baseball bat and that that blow to the head could have caused his death. And that the Anna and her, and her um, attorneys of defense never had that information during the first trial. So she got a the opportunity for a second trial. And then that second trial was also, that she was convicted a second time. And then that conviction was also overturned. Um, and so by the time we had been corresponding for about five years, she was on her third trial. Her third trial was about to begin. And as that third trial was about to begin, she started writing me more letters. She wrote me once to say, that like she asked me she asked me to call her she asked if she could sorry she asked if she could call me she asked for my phone number she asked if i would go visit her in prison um she was asking for a lot of things but she was asking me to write about her and to write about her case specifically one point which was she said that after um her case was overturned. She said that the prosecution had offered her a plea deal and said, if you plead guilty um, to second degree murder, you'll get 20 years. And because since you've already been in prison for about 25 years, you'll be out, you'll be out in a matter of weeks. And she said she considered this, she considered pleading guilty so that she could be out of prison, but because she had surviving children, she didn't want to do this. She said she had not killed her son. She didn't want to confess to something she didn't do because she wanted her children to know the truth. She said, even if I have to stay in prison, I want my children to know that I didn't kill their brother. I didn't kill my son. And that is more important to me than anything. And so I thought, she's telling the truth, of course. They offered her a plea deal. And that meant that she could be free and she didn't take it because she wanted her surviving children to know the truth. And so I believed her, of course I believed her. I also believed her because I did my own research and found that there was in fact a confession from the other woman um, who said that she had hit the baby with a baseball bat and that the baseball bat had possibly caused his death. And so um, I listened to her 
and we kept corresponding as the third trial um, was getting as we were getting closer to the third trial I stopped writing um, I, I had fallen so deep into the research and reading so much um, about this case and reading pouring over court transcripts and confessions and newspapers for over 20 years watching video of the one time she was interviewed by um, a journalist, a Spanish language journalist for um, a news program here in Miami that I was like, I can't, I can't think about this anymore. I'm having nightmares about this case. This is not like, this is the other side of reason. I can't keep following this story. I didn't give her my phone number so that she, she didn't call me. And so I wanted to create some sort of distance between me and the story. And I was also working on my book. And so I, I just, I couldn't. And um, so she wrote me, she kept writing me letters. At some point she wrote a letter almost every day and I kept getting letters in the mail and I didn't respond to them. Her, um, some of her letters were like, please come to my trial. And so when the third trial started, I went, I went to the, to the courtroom and I sat there and listened to her um, testimony. It was the first time she actually got on the stand and was testifying. And I sat in the trial with other journalists and watched all of this unfolding and then realized as she was sitting on the stand and the prosecution was asking her questions that she was actually lying. That some of what she said was not what she said in her letters. And at one point I realized the prosecution had caught her in three separate lies. And um, during their closing arguments, the prosecution brought up those lies and it became clear that she had been lying the whole time, that she had been lying to everyone, that she had been lying to me in her letters, that she had been manipulating me so that I would write about her in a very specific way. And, um, what was more troubling to me was when they presented evidence of the baby's injuries and when they showed the baby, um, when they projected the image of the baby on an autopsy table and his body and the injuries, some of which I'd already seen, but had seen, saw projected and large for the first time, something that made me want to vomit, something that made me want to look away and get up, leave the courtroom and cry. And people behind me, journalists who didn't know, who didn't know her and who didn't know this child were crying or were, were gasping, were, were very, very emotional. We were all in the courtroom, like, what is happening? And I looked over at her and she was nodding off. Like she was not feeling anything, she was bored. And I realized that this woman had absolutely no remorse. She, had, she was feeling nothing as the rest of us were clearly very, very affected. And um, that was a point when I was sitting in that courtroom looking at her and listening to people behind me saying, is she falling asleep? Is she seriously falling asleep? When I realized that she had played me, that she had used, she had used me because she wanted something out of me. She did want to control the narrative. And um, all those times in her letters, what she told me was probably not true. And the plea deal that she told me she'd gotten was probably not true. Um, and I realized that I had put myself in a way in that position because I wanted so much to believe her. And after, after that trial, um, after she was caught in all those lies, she was convicted again, but this time they didn't sentence her to death. She got life in prison and that's where she is now. And she, after she was convicted, she doesn't write me anymore.